what does it mean to be inside the solar system, right? Uh, what, who's a member of the solar system and at what point do we stop counting things? You know, and, there, and there's various definitions out there. And the most commonly used one, which is a totally legit definition, is the heliopause, the region where the, the solar wind just starts to mix together with the general interstellar medium, you know, all the high energy particles that are always buzzing around. That transition zone is is pretty far away actually we have the voyager probes which one has already passed through it or is in the middle of it and one is just now entering it and that distance is about eight light hours away which means it takes light eight hours to go from the sun to the heliopause you know contrast that with the earth which is only eight light minutes away and you can tell that heliopause is pretty far away and the voyager probes took like four decades to travel that distance, going 36,000 miles per hour, four decades to go from the Earth to the heliopause, which is only four, or is, excuse me, is only eight light hours away. But there's more stuff that's a member of the solar system outside the heliopause, technically in interstellar space, but gravitationally bound to the sun. And that's because the sun's gravity, I mean, technically extends to infinity, right? You can be on the opposite side of the universe and technically you feel a little bit of a gravitational tug towards the sun. It's not quite zero. It might as well be zero. So we don't really care, but technically it's there. But outside the heliopause in interstellar space, the sun's gravity is still strong enough to matter. It's still strong enough, even though it's incredibly weak out there, it's still strong enough to hold some things in orbit. And you have to imagine being out here at this distance of, say, 20,000 AU. 20,000 AU. That is 20,000 times further than the earth is from the sun. I mean, just imagine, and there are objects out there that are still gravitationally a part of the solar system. So that's that's straight up interstellar space, right? This is the, the realm between the stars, and yet the sun's gravity is still strong enough to affect motions and keep things in orbit. We think this is the Oort cloud, or what we call the Oort cloud, this region far outside the boundaries of the solar system of, of the heliopause in interstellar space, but still under the gravitational influence of the sun. And you just have to imagine what life is like out here for the comets. We don't know how many comets there are. We don't, we're not exactly sure how big the Oort cloud is. There's somewhere we estimate based on uh, simulations and formation models, there is somewhere around a trillion comets that are at least a mile across or at least a kilometer or two across. A trillion, at least a trillion, maybe more, maybe a little bit less. Definitely, if you start counting smaller and smaller objects, it's way more than a trillion. But that's that's what we're talking about. The Oort cloud could be anywhere, you know, the inner boundary is maybe 2,000 AU astronomical units. Oh, wait, by the way, I didn't define that. AU is astronomical unit. It's the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So this could be anywhere from 2,000 AU for the inner boundary. The outer boundary is, I don't know, 100,000, 200,000 AU. It's, it's pushing up into the, like, close to the distance of our nearest neighbor star. I mean, we're talking light years. Once you get 100,000 AU, you, you tend to switch from AU to light years because it, it's a little bit more convenient. So this tremendous volume of space that exists, we're pretty sure, in a shell around the solar system. And in my next video, by the way, I'm going to explain why we think the Oort cloud exists. But for today, I want to, I want to tell a story on the, of the journey of a comet from the Oort cloud into the inner solar system. Because these comets, these objects, are orbiting the sun at such an extreme distance 
the sun isn't a disk anymore. It's too far away for that. It's the sun is just a a slightly brighter star in the sky. Right? You, you know, you're in interstellar space. Imagine in these freezing depths between the stars. Stars coating your entire field of view, no matter where you look. And there's one star in particular that is dominant. It's like it's almost like a, a, a pinprick, a painful point of light more than a disk. But that's the sun, and that's how far away you are. And your orbits around this star, around our sun, take hundreds or thousands of years. And it will be in any random orientation. You're so far away from the sun, you're not going to be locked down to a disk or a plane like the planets are, the asteroids are. You're going to have any sort of orbit you want. And you will stay in this orbit for millions of years, billions of years, potentially. This is all you know. If you're a comet, for most, the majority, the vast majority of your life, this is all you know. And the vast majority of comets will just stay out here in the Oort cloud in the freezing cold outskirts of the most distant edges of what we could possibly define to be the solar system. will spend their entire lives out there, never doing anything else. But every once in a while, there is an unlucky interaction. Every once in a while, maybe a star passes nearby. You know, just through the random motions of stars in the galaxies. One happens to come within, you know, a couple light years maybe. Introduces some gravitational tugs that changes the orbits. Maybe a giant molecular cloud just wanders by, you know, every million of years or so. Just sails on through. That's an extra tug of gravity and that affects orbits. But... What we think is the most dominant effect of modifying the orbits here in the Oort cloud and that triggers some comets to fall into the inner solar system is the Milky Way galaxy itself. That's right, right? Like the galaxy itself is affecting the motion of comets. And that's because at these huge distances... When you're like a light year away from the sun, you're in interstellar space, you care about the gravity of the Milky Way galaxy. And the gravity on one side of the solar system is going to be just a little bit different than the gravity on the other side of the solar system. Just through pure random chance, or just the structure of our own galaxy, it it's changes with density from place to place. And that this is called the galactic tide, by the way. It's, it's, a, it's a gravitational differences in the, in the Milky Way galaxy itself. So what happens, what we think happens, is that if there's a comet, and let's say, you know, gravity is a little bit stronger on this side of the solar system, and gravity is a little bit weaker on this side of the solar system, as the comet is doing its orbit, like this, it's going around the sun, it's taking hundreds of years, thousands of years, when it's up here, there's a little bit stronger gravity than there is back there. There'll be a tug in its orbit, just a, whoop, just a little nudge. Barely, barely see it, affect it, but just a little. And then it'll loop back around, get a little tug over here because there's a tide, there's a difference in gravity. Come back around, an extra little tug, an extra little tug, an extra little tug. What this, what this galactic tide does is stretch orbits out. Every time that comet is at its furthest point in its orbit, it gets pulled just a little bit more than last time, and then a little bit more than last time, and then a little bit more, and this is regular. So orbit after orbit, over the course of you know, millions of years, this orbit of the comet starts to stretch out. It gets pulled further and further away from the sun. But the way orbits work, the way orbits work is that if you start out with like a circular orbit like this and you start stretching out one end, you're going to shrink the other end. So over time, this galactic tide, this effect from the gravity itself starts to squish orbits and make the orbits more and more elliptical with time. And eventually, it gets to the point, if the comet is unlucky enough, then it reaches such an extreme distance at its furthest point 
that when it swings back around into the inner solar system, it hits the inner solar system. It doesn't stay outside in the Oort cloud. It, this, the skinny side of his orbit has shrunk so much that now it passes through the heliopause. It passes within the orbit of Neptune. It passes within the orbit of the giant planets. It passes within the orbit of the asteroid belt and Mars and Earth. And it encounters the sun. Now, once a comet is inside the solar system, a few different things can happen. If it's lucky, it will encounter one of the giant planets, usually Jupiter or Saturn, and get yanked around and then just kicked out of the solar system. Gone. If it's lucky. If it's lucky. Because if it's unlucky and it makes it through the, the guardians of our solar system and enters the innermost parts of the solar system, then it's doomed then it's doomed. The second preferable fate, you know, option number one, if you're a comet finding yourself in the inner solar system, you hope you encounter a giant planet so you get kicked back out. Otherwise, you're just going to beg for a, a, a quick and merciful death and just slam right into the sun. And a lot of comets do. They just, boom, they just hit the sun and that's it. They're dead. The unluckiest comets survive the first passage through the inner solar system and then they swing back out but then now they're locked they're in a brand new orbit they're going to come back again and again and again and every single time the comet enters the inner solar system it loses a little bit of itself it's way hotter now in the inner solar system than it is you know a light year away and so any ices that make up its body evaporate this generates the tail of a comet, it can start to break apart from all these expanding gases inside of it from being heat, heated up close to the sun, and it won't last long. Once a comet gets locked into the inner solar system, it doesn't have long. Maybe 50 orbits, maybe a thousand orbits until it just disintegrates, just completely gets blasted apart from all the radiation. Another unlucky gravitational interaction gets kicked out of the solar system altogether, or it just becomes dead, where it doesn't generate tails, doesn't have any ices, and just looks like another dumb asteroid. That is the ultimate fate of these comets that can spend millions of years in total peace, and then when they fall into the inner solar system from that gravitational tide... They only got a few thousand years left, tops. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. And don't forget to go to patreon.com slash pmsutter. There's a button right there to help keep these shows and all my education and outreach activities going. And I'll see you next time.